Morning, Gloria, America. Bonjour. Hi. The chaos at Cable Airport is less chaotic. American troops have secured the perimeter. It is still a desperate situation. Thousands of Afghanis are trying to get to the airport. The American Marines have established a perimeter. Six Afghanis fell to their death from airplanes yesterday. It's been confirmed by the New York Times. The president's disastrous speech yesterday has been widely and everywhere panned. I wish to begin this hour by reviewing with you reactions to the speech. Here is Senator Tom Cotton on Fox News with Neil Cavuto not long after it was given. Cut number one. That speech demonstrated a president who is dangerously disconnected from reality. You can put aside the question of the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan and just focus on how that decision has been executed over the last couple weeks, Neil. Uh, the president seemed totally oblivious to the conditions on the ground. He acted as if, as if this withdrawal is going in an orderly fashion, when in fact we have hundreds, if not thousands of Americans stuck behind Taliban lines who have no clear instructions on how to get to the airport and get out of the country. Joe Biden didn't say a word to them. Furthermore, he claimed that we would somehow con continue to conduct over-the-horizon counterterrorism operations, that he, as he called it, with exquisite proficiency. I guess that's going to be exactly like he's conducted this chaotic, disorganized fiasco of an evacuation for American citizens. I mean, the president claimed that uh, he wanted credit for the raid to kill Osama bin Laden. Now, he may have forgotten that 10 years ago he was loudly and famously opposed to the mission to get bin Laden. Yet surely he can see what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan right now, which is the direct consequence of his ill-planned, disorganized decision to withdraw from Afghanistan. Then Jake Tapper, following the speech on CNN, said this, cut number seven. The worsening crisis in Afghanistan, forced to speak uh, to the nation after the calamity of the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, the president stated, that he stands squarely behind the decision he made to withdraw all U.S. forces from Afghanistan, even though he has, in fact, been forced to send roughly 6,000 back in. The president saying, in fact, that if anything, the events of the last few days, this foreign policy and humanitarian disaster, proves to him that he made the right decision, given the fleeing of Afghan politicians from the country and the collapse of the Afghan military. The president said that the buck stopped with him, but in fact, the speech was full of finger pointing and blame, especially for the Afghans, even saying that while the U.S. would be working to rescue those Americans and U.S. allies who needed to be saved, he claimed part of the reason why the U.S. did not save sooner Afghan allies, the translators and others who work with the U.S. military, who fear being slaughtered by the Taliban, they didn't act sooner, the president said, because some Afghans, he claimed, did not want to leave earlier because they were hopeful about a new Afghan government. Mr. Biden also said that the Afghan government discouraged the U.S. from ordering a mass exodus uh, for fear of triggering a crisis of confidence, the president said. Mr. Biden also focused on the larger decision to end the U.S. presence in Afghanistan. That was, in fact, his larger focus, whether or not the U.S. should continue to be there. He did not really get into or accept any blame for the catastrophic exit that we have been watching on television in the last several days. Our former Secretary of Defense under President Obama, former CIA Director under President Obama, former Chief of Staff under Bill Clinton, Leon Panetta, said this on CNN to John King, cut number nine. Uh, you know, in many ways, uh, I think of John Kennedy and the Bay of Pigs. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it unfolded quickly and... Uh, uh, the president thought that everything would be fine, and uh, that was not the case. But President Kennedy took responsibility for what took place. And I, I, I strongly recommend to President Biden that he take responsibility, admit the mistakes that were made. He's got to be he, – he has been, I think, truthful with the American people. He's got to continue to be very truthful. Uh, we've been through a difficult few days here uh, in Afghanistan, and he's got to make clear – to the American people that as commander in chief, he is going to continue to protect our national security and that we are gonna go after terrorists wherever the hell they're at. He's just got to ensure that the United States of America remains a strong world leader that can work with our allies to try to protect peace and prosperity. That's the message he's gotta give the American people and the world because our credibility right now 
uh, is in question. Peter Baker of the New York Times, a frequent guest on this program. Indeed, he was yesterday. We are live inside the Beltway this morning. Joined MSNBC's Andrea Mitchell and said this, cut number 10. Is, 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 is sort of unfathomable. I mean, the truth is, I'm not an intelligence expert. I don't know what the intelligence agencies told the president, but certainly enough people have told this White House over the months that this was an almost inevitable outcome, whether it happened today, tomorrow, or, or months from now. Almost everybody understood that this is what was going to happen. So knowing that that was the case and knowing that it could happen very quickly, given the history in Af- Afghanistan, uh, you know, clearly they didn't move fast enough, uh, orderly enough, to avoid the exact kind of chaos we're seeing right now. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, situation that the, uh, the administration has, uh, uh, you know, has, is, has to deal with at this point. Admiral John Kirby, retired spokesperson for the Biden Pentagon, was engaged by an Afghan woman reporter at the press room at the Pentagon, cut number 13. Thank you so much, John. As you know, I'm from Afghanistan, and I'm, I'm very upset today because Afghan women didn't expect that overnight all the Taliban came. They took off my flag. This is my flag. And they put their flag. Everybody is uh, upset, especially women. And I forgot my question to me. What do you ask? Where is my president, former President Ghani? People expected that he bye-bye with the people. And immediately he ran away. We don't know where is he. And we don't have a president. President Biden said that President Ghani, no. He has to fight uh, for us people. They have to do everything, and we were able to uh, financially help them. But we don't have any president. We don't have anything. Afghan people, they don't know what to do. A woman has a lot of achievement in Afghanistan. I had a lot of achievement. I, I left from the Taliban like 20 years ago. Now we go back to the first step again. Do you have any comment? We have our president. You should answer to Afghan people. Well, I obviously can't. That's all you need to hear. Uh, Followed up by Mike Rogers on CNN, former chair of the House Intel Committee, talking with Jim Shudo, cut number 16. Well, I mean, to say that they were surprised by events is a little bit shocking because the intelligence for months has said that this thing is deteriorating quickly. And it was a combination of messages that were being sent to the Taliban. When in negotiations, they started talking about, well, would you leave our embassies alone? Well, the Taliban said that's a clue. Uh, when our last warrior commander, Scott Miller, packed up and flew out uh, about a month ago, that sent another very strong message. So we moved all of our ability to have uh, airstrikes to keep them back mm-hmm. seven hours away. And yeah. so all the CIA of these analyst were, Matt Zeller was on MSNBC with Brian Williams cut 19. I hope he gets to own their deaths, too. I, I don't I feel like I watched a different speech than the rest of you guys. I was appalled. There was such a profound, bold faced lie in that speech. The idea that we plan for every contingency. I have been personally trying to tell this administration since it took office. I've been trying to tell our government for years that this was coming. We sent them plan after plan on how to evacuate these people. Nobody listened to us. They didn't plan for the evacuation of our Afghan wartime allies. They're trying to conduct it now at the 11th hour. The thing that they were most concerned about was the optics of a chaotic evacuation. Well, they got exactly what they were most concerned of by failing to do what was right when we could have done it. We had Susan all Del Percio, MSNBC political analyst, cut number 22. This is also this happened under President Biden. He changed the deadline from May 1st to September 11th. So he already was able to change deadlines. Secondly, we should hold him accountable for his leadership during this time, which has frankly been an utter failure. This, what we are seeing on the ground right now, should have been done differently. And there is only one person to hold responsible, and that is President Biden. I will continue to bring you live updates on the conditions at Kabul airport as the collapse continues, the catastrophe continues. Joe Biden remains in hiding, did not take one question, ran faster from reporters than the refugees did on the tarmac at Kabul airport. Stay tuned. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. David Drucker joins me from the Washington Examiner. David, maybe the worst presidential speeches in a crisis ever. David Axelrod said we needed a Bay of Pigs. We didn't get it. There was a whisper of a threat against the Taliban. 
Have you found, let me ask the, it's easy to find an avalanche of criticism, even from his traditional ally. Did anyone think it was a good speech? Anybody at all? Uh, David, you might be on mute. Is Drucker there? there. Yeah. You? you? Da- yeah, you're there now. Uh, did anybody think it was a good speech? Well. David, you're breaking up on us again. Yeah, it's a cell phone. Let's let's hang up and try again. And uh, I really do want to hear from Drucker if I missed any. I, I don't want to be unfair to the president, uh, as he has been unfair to millions of people in Afghanistan. Um, I don't want to present one side as he presented one side. I, I want to give someone a chance. I just can't find it. Nobody except uh, members of his staff are defending the speech. Drucker's back. Let's try again, David. Is anyone defending that speech? Well, look, his, as you noted, members of his staff are defending the speech. There are some Democratic activists and, and analysts out there defending the speech. Uh, but I think, by and large, he had two audiences here. He had a domestic audience, and he had an overseas audience, adversaries and allies alike. And I think it missed the mark in, in, in regard to explaining his broader strategy and making clear that whatever the images people were seeing on TV, um, this wasn't... Uh, indicative of of U.S. policy. But but the challenge for the president is even had he done that, uh, there is damage done because of the images that people have seen. Images to his own foreign policy agenda, because if if presumably he wants to play hardball with certain actors out there, they're going to look at what happened and say, or else what? And that's a problem that he is going to have to deal with. David, you know, um, I, I, I know Admiral Kirby. I've met him a couple of times. He's a wonderful guy. He truly is a, a fine public expert. I know Ned Price, been a guest on this show. He's a lefty, but I like Ned Price. I know Ron Klain. I know uh, all a lot of people in this. They're good people. I think uh, Jake Sullivan is a fine national security advisor, and, and uh, Tony Blinken and I share best friends or, or great friends, band friends. I do not believe... They believe what they're being asked to say, and they're burning up their no, credibility. No. There's, there, there's no way they believe what they're being asked to say, but the president makes the decisions. And this is, you know, Hugh, I like to say this all the time. Um, I think right and left voters, everybody makes too much of a big deal over who you surround yourself with. You know, people like to say that personnel is policy, and that may be true. But at the presidential level, the president tends to make the big decisions. And when you work for the president, your choice is either carry – out the orders or resign. I think a lot of um, these individuals believe in the president, believe in the mission they have, and they don't have any other choice. And this is, by the way, from a foreign policy standpoint, this is who Biden has always been. Uh, he wanted, he believed in a premature pullout from Iraq. Yeah, uh, never uh, let, let me stop you, though, there, David. I, I've heard that. This is not who he's always been. It is the policy he has always pursued, but he has never been this stubborn and angry. We saw age yesterday. We saw the 80 years on his face. We saw the angriness in his voice. We saw the inflexibility and absolutely the way, and I'm getting there in another 15 or 20 years. I'll be that stubborn if God grants me those years, but this is different. He's closed down. Well, look, that's one way to look at it. To me, it was a familiar Joe Biden on matters of foreign policy. He didn't really look that much different to me than he had looked over the last two decades or so when it came to um, where he has been on different elements of the war on terror. And the Afghanistan mission was always about the war on terror. And he had an opportunity when he came into office to reverse the beginnings of a withdrawal. And instead, he decided to pursue it full force. And, uh, you know, and, and David, it makes me crazy. Shocking. They won't even admit what the president, former president said, Pompeo has said, everyone has said, conditions based. If the Taliban break the agreement and the agreement, paragraph four, signed in February of 2020, is that there will be a negotiated power sharing agreement. The moment they attacked Kunduz was the moment they broke that. And we gave up Bagram. We didn't have to give up Bagram. The 2,500 troops could have stayed there forever. Will anyone admit how badly they've done this? Well, I I don't know if anybody has to admit it because it's plain. I mean, look, the the president, the same way he's reversed his predecessor on other policies, could have reversed his predecessor on this. 
um, and and chose not to. But but he wouldn't have had to. Rever- uh, that's that's what I'm trying to get to. The policy no, was conditions yeah. based. He could have done yeah, what Trump are, would have done. There, right, but there are two different issues here. Right, there is how poorly he has handled this withdrawal, and then there's the issue of the withdrawal itself. And I think what you saw was a president committed to withdrawal no matter what, and he wasn't going to let anything stop him from completing the withdrawal. I think you saw a president emerge from the bunker and go back in for many reasons, one of which he doesn't have the capacity to deal with what is incoming, that he's never dealt with in his life well, and he's angry and isolated, and it's actually kind of scary who's running the country. Told Axios about the preparations they inherited from the Trump administration. None of this was on the shelf, so to speak. When we got in on January 20th, we saw that the cupboard was bare. Your comment, Senator. Just you preposterous blame shifting uh, from a president who gave a speech yesterday that was dangerously detached from reality. Um, you know, he said he, uh, the buck stopped with him, Hugh, um, and he spent that entire speech trying to pass the buck to the Trump administration, as it sounds like these administration officials are doing on background mail, or to the Afghan political leadership or the Afghan military or even the Afghan civilians who are being targeted by the Taliban now. Um, you know, the Biden administration has complained about a lot of Trump policies that didn't uh, prevent them from changing almost every Trump policy that they adopted, uh, such as the Remain in Mexico policy at the border. Yet somehow this is the one policy, the Afghan policy, in which their hands were tied and they could do nothing. Uh, when in reality, you, what you're seeing is the chickens coming home to roost for Joe Biden. Uh, as Bob Gates said 10 years ago, Joe Biden has been wrong about nearly every major foreign policy and national security issue for the last four decades. Make 18, five decades may, now. May I interrupt you, sir, because eight, 18 months ago, uh, Senator uh, Secretary Gates was on this show where he said he stood by that statement and he added this, cut number 32. What you have said that from your memoir that was the most controversial thing is that uh, Vice President Biden, former Vice President Biden, hadn't been right on any major foreign policy issue in 40 years. Do you worry about a Biden administration and that fundamental inability to grasp great power competition infecting that West Wing? Yeah, I stand by that statement. Uh, I will say, Hugh, it, it related mainly to um, um, things that had happened in the Cold War. Biden voted against every single arms program, I think, that Ronald Reagan put up on the Hill. Um, he voted for the uh, Iraq War uh, and, and so on. Uh, so I do have those policy differences with him. I will say in the Obama administration, uh, we did have a very deep disagreement on Afghanistan, and that was that was a big deal. But on issues like uh, in, uh, intervening in Libya and, and dumping Mubarak in Egypt, uh, I was I he and I actually were on the same side on those issues. So, I you know, and the other thing I write about in the book that. Uh, that hasn't gotten much attention is that I also think that uh, the the vice president had some issues with the military. And I wrote in duty about how he would warn the president that he was being boxed in, that the military was trying to take away his options and so on. And, and he'd kind of rail at the generals and, uh, and, and that bothered me some. So, you know, I, there are puts and takes with, you know, any presidential candidate, uh, um, he brings a decency and a and integrity and and so on to the to the race, uh, but uh, but I did have these issues with him. Senator Cotton, uh, the integrity and decency was wholly absent yesterday, but the railing at the generals may have led up to this. Have you heard the same reports I have that he rejected all military advice on preparation for this? Um, Yes, of course, you everyone in Washington knows that Joe Biden even acknowledged as much earlier this year. Um, But what you're seeing are those chickens coming home to roost. Add another decade to Bob Gates's observation. It's been five decades of disastrous foreign policy and national security judgment by Joe Biden. The difference is for the first 50 years, uh, it didn't really matter because he was a senator and a vice president. He was not in charge. He is now the commander in chief. And on the first major foreign policy crisis he has faced, you see the disastrous consequences of his terrible judgment. Um, I mean, Joe Biden for the last five or six days has been essentially holed up in Camp David 
I, I think, shell-shocked uh, at how terrible his judgment has proven in the real world. He came to Washington for a couple hours yesterday to give a speech in which, again, he blamed everyone but himself um, and then retreated back to Camp David once again. Are we in 25th Amendment area? <laughs> well, given what the alternative is with Kamala Harris, uh, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, but we are in an area in which uh, America is now dangerously exposed. Um, so much of our security depends on the credibility and the resolve of the president in particular. And in the same way that when Barack Obama erased his red line in Syria, it had cascading effects all around the world in places like Crimea in Europe or the South China Sea in East Asia, as Russia and China saw how weak Barack Obama was, the world can now see that Joe Biden is impotent and incompetent. And we should not be surprised that you see Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping and other adversaries of America use already using this to their advantage. And I got to tell you, if I was sitting tonight in Taiwan or in eastern Ukraine or maybe even places like Israel, I would be very worried about America's resolve. Uh, you use the term shell shocked and you're a combat veteran. So I, I my ears picked up. Yesterday, Jim Garrity, I think, legitimately asked, is there something wrong with the president because he'd been missing MIA for uh, 48, 72 hours? Do you have concern over his capacity to absorb and react appropriately to information? Uh, After that speech, I do, Hugh. I mean, again, that was a dangerous detachment from reality, totally oblivious to the conditions on the ground that he alone had created. He repeatedly overruled the best military advice of his commanders. This was not about you just with the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan, a question on which reasonable people disagree, but how that decision was executed. It was Joe Biden, I assure you, who insisted that all troops be gone by September 11th. Hugh, that is a politically symbolic date, but a tactically dangerous date. That is still at the height of the fighting season in Afghanistan. He already had, he said he was tied by, uh, uh, the former administration's agreement with the Taliban, the date that, <clears throat> that that agreement had said is May 1. So we'd already blown through that date. There was no reason other than Joe Biden wanted to beat his chest and crow on September 11th about getting American troops out of Afghanistan to choose that date. And now look at the political symbolism. Rather than celebrating all of our troops being out of Afghanistan on September 11th, the flag of the Taliban will be flying over our former embassy on September 11th. Uh, Senator, I want to go back to the Axios report. Uh, it says that the Biden officials, and to, uh, very senior, I, I have my guesses, Trump effectively didn't have a plan to bring home all Americans, including troops, contractors, and diplomats safely. One said that created, quote, headwinds and, quote, unnecessarily increased, close quote, the degree of difficulty for the new administration. Quote, the entire policy process had atrophied, one of the officials said. Quote, it was really manifest here. On the other hand, they set a May deadline for the withdrawal, the official said. On the other hand, there was no intra-agency planning on how to execute a withdrawal. Your comment on that, and could you, if you had been elected president on January 20th, organize an exit that would not have led to catastrophic loss of life and the abandonment of allies and interpreters and women who ought to have been removed? You not only could I have executed uh, that plan, any Marine captain or mid-career Foreign Service officer could probably have executed that plan. Again, what's being conducted is called a non-combatant evacuation operation. The Marine Corps has very well-detailed plans for such operations. The State Department takes the lead. They have officials who are experienced in these things. It was Joe Biden's decision to choose a politically symbolic date to withdraw all of our troops uh, from Afghanistan, almost all of our troops from Afghanistan, when we still had as many as 10,000 American citizens. Not, I'm not even talking about the Afghans who helped us, Hugh, but American citizens with American passports behind Taliban lines. My office has heard from hundreds of them over the last 48 hours. We've helped some of them get out of their uh, hiding places and get to the airport, but many are still stranded awaiting guidance. I mean, Hugh, I- I've heard from so many Arkansans who have no military experience, no law enforcement experience, no diplomatic experience, who cannot believe the situation in Afghanistan. Like, who in their right mind 
would have thought that we would withdraw our four-star commander, Scotty Miller, and close Bagram Air Base, the air base that we had total control over, while leaving behind thousands of civilians. It should be the yeah. exact opposite to you. I mean, I, you, should I, let, you should keep control of the air base and leave your troops in place until you get your civilians out. Even ordinary Americans who have no experience in such operations believe that was the case and are astonished to learn it wasn't. I've heard from so many of them over the last 48 hours. I have more confidence in CNN's Jeff Zucker organizing this than anyone in the administration because he's got correspondents around the world and he moves them around. Honestly, I'm, I'm dumbfounded at how we could have done this. Let me talk to you about the Trump policy. Every never-Trumper who ever lived is using this as an opportunity to say it would have been the same because otherwise they're complicit for the election of Joe Biden and this fiasco and therefore they're laying. It would have been the same. Would this have been the same if President Trump had been reelected? You know, Hugh, you can't rerun history um, I, I, and predict what would have happened under those circumstances. Here's what I don't think uh, President Trump, or for that matter, almost any other uh, president with an ounce of common sense would have done is proceeded with any kind of withdrawal while the Taliban was on the offensive, violating its commitments, um, and withdrawn American troops and especially American air support during the middle of the withdrawal. And remember, this is how we train the Afghan army to fight you, uh, not fighting with our air force, but with their own, yet supported by American contractors. I'm not talking about, you know, soldiers with their feet dangling out the side of the Black Hawk ready to launch an air assault operation. I'm talking about mechanics and other logisticians who are helping the Afghan Air Force support the Afghan troops. When Joe Biden insisted they withdraw, too, over the last few weeks, we totally pulled the rug out from underneath the Afghan National Army. Um, so it, it's hard to rerun history um, and think about what would have been different under different leadership or different circumstances. But it's hard to imagine how anyone could have bungled this operation more so than Joe Biden has. Well, I do believe that it was a conditions-based withdrawal. I have read the Doha Agreement. Uh, paragraph 4, I believe, says there will be a, 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 a negotiated agreement. It does not. It is premised on there not being an attack on Kandahar and Kabul, in my view. I haven't read the annexes, and there are some secret annexes. But I know this, and Mark Thiessen has made this argument, more than 50,000 Afghan soldiers are KIA since 2015 fighting for their country. More than 2,800 are KIA since January of this year. I believe the last American casualty was in 2020. Is it fair for Joe Biden to shame the Afghan army from whom we pulled all support, according to the Wall Street Journal, months ago? No, it, again, it's totally unfair to you. Again, um, despite its shortcomings, the Afghan army had been trained to fight very similar to our forces with close air support. And Joe Biden pulled the rug out from underneath them. He insisted that all of the technical and logistical support uh, that American contractors were giving to them get out over the last month. Um, again, those were not American helicopters. They were not American service members. They were American contractors who were doing things like making sure their aircraft could continue to be fueled and fly. And if you train any army to fight in one way and you take away a critical part of that training, of course they are going to be hamstrung. And that's exactly what you've seen over the last month in Afghanistan. And it all goes back once again to Joe Biden's decision to choose a, a politically symbolic but tactically dangerous day to execute this withdrawal decision. You can Senator disagree Cotton. about the withdrawal decision, but Joe Biden has, has completely mishandled the execution of that withdrawal. Senator Cotton, I, I have one last area of questions, and I'm a civilian, so I don't know, and I don't want to criticize the Pentagon. There has been no discussion except a brief statement that was posted on Twitter and then withdrawn about the rules of engagement for the Marines and the 101st Airborne, which is reported to be there and, and you, of which you are an alumni. Are you confident that our troops have the authority to protect themselves and everyone at the airport and will use that authority? So, for, Hugh, from what I have heard from senior military leadership, uh, as well as my contacts on the ground, uh, that they do have that authority. American troops always have the inherent right of self-defense. I think the challenge they face in the early hours, uh, Sunday night and Monday morning, is that the people who were approaching the airport were not Taliban fighters. They were terrified civilians. Uh, so it was more about uh, non-combatant crowd control than it was fighting off the Taliban. My understanding now is they have a secure perimeter at the airport, 
uh, that flights are landing and taking off. However, they don't have much standoff. Uh, they don't have distance between the perimeter and civilians or combatants on the outside, as the case may be. So it is a dangerous and volatile situation, a situation that would not have happened if we still had control of Bagram Air Base, Hugh. Bagram Air Base sits in the middle of a wide open plain with hundreds, if not thousands of yards of visual standoff. Uh, Kabul International Airport is right smack in the middle of Kabul. So again, it's Joe Biden that has created this dangerous situation on the ground that puts at risk the lives of American troopers and civilians, as well as innocent Afghans. Reporters for the British Telegraph have reported <clears throat> that the British government is worried about terrorist attacks by splinter groups. In other words, the Taliban ain't the only group of terrorists operating, giving the lie to the president's we've destroyed al-Qaeda. Have you heard those reports? Is the Pentagon prepared? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm very worried about the potential for terrorist attacks. Uh, of all stripes, you. I mean, I'm worried about a terrorist attack you know, so through, say, a car bomb or suicide bomber on the perimeter of that airport. I'm worried that if there is some kind of slapdash, disorganized evacuation of Afghans without any vetting of who they are, that al-Qaeda or ISIS could slip operatives onto an American airplane. Um, I'm worried about the, uh, the crowing and the celebrating that you see from the Taliban and other terrorist groups. Nothing breeds more terrorism like the success of these radical Islamic groups. So I, I sadly think that you're going to see a large surge into Afghanistan of Islamist terrorists from around the world. You're going to see the safe havens that al-Qaeda had reconstituted in Afghanistan, which is the number one security interest we've always had for 20 years in Afghanistan. And what Joe Biden has never explained in five months how he was going to prevent. Yesterday, he was talking about over-the-horizon uh, strike capability. Well, you know, Q, if the over-the-horizon counter-terrorist strike capability is as proficient as this evacuation has been, I think we should be very worried about a terrorist safe haven in Afghanistan. My last question, Senator Cotton, I salute the heroism of reporters, journalists, and humanitarians who are at work in Afghanistan. I am, however, concerned that pictures from Afghanistan, there is a criminal element. There is money to be made by nabbing Americans. You know that. O'Brien, the former national security, is your friend and my friend. He was the hostage negotiator. Is it responsible for any American to stay in Afghanistan right now, regardless of how important the news is and humanitarian efforts? Yes, Hugh, I would urge uh, any American to try to get out of the country. Um, they should have been registered for the State Department's SMS alert system. They should be getting notified about when to report to the airport. Like I said, we've heard from hundreds of them who were um, unable to contact the State Department at the height of the chaos over the weekend. We've helped a few of them get to the airport already. We're still working with those. But um, any American um, in Afghanistan who has the ability to get out safely, I'd strongly advise them to do so. I know that's heartbreaking for many of them, whether they have local Afghan partners, friends, um, even Afghan family that are not eligible. Uh, but at this point, I think it's the safest for the Americans in, in Afghanistan, it's the best thing for the national security interests of our country for them to try to find a way to get safe passage. I have one. I, I, I lied. One more question, Senator. Zawahiri, I expect to pop up on video if he's not dead. What do you think about him? And what is your estimate of Pakistan's complicity in this? Um, well, Pakistan uh, has long harbored uh, the Taliban, whether they do that actively or they acquiesce to it. Um, so they have some complicity in the strength that the Taliban has regathered in recent years. Uh, but Hugh, uh, they should be very careful because, um, as Churchill said, appeasement is often uh, feeding the alligator, hoping that it will eat you last. Um, the lines that, um, that of the Taliban support do not acknowledge the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. There's a lot of Taliban in western Pakistan. And Hugh, if the gathering strength of the Taliban in Afghanistan leads to the gathering strength of their compatriots in Pakistan and that destabilizes the Pakistani government, then you would have the true worst case scenario in which a terrorist supporting organization potentially could get access to Pakistan's nuclear weapons. Senator Tom Cotton, thank you for your extra time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, that was Senator Tom Cotton. We will make that available. Um, I, I'm appalled by this attempt to additional blame shift this morning in Axios, which is intended for Beltway. It's intended to cue the media. It's intended to tell the media, oh, it's all Trump's fault. That is the most absurd thing.
as Senator Cotton said, any Marine captain could have organized this from January forward, could have gotten the diplomats and the soldiers out, any Marine captain. And I believe that the senator is absolutely right. I, I don't think, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that civilians could have done better. I'm here to tell you that the generals, if told to organize a retreat that would have been effective, and if Joe Biden had deferred to them, had systematically listened to them, they would have held on to Bagram, they would have gotten our diplomats out, they would have left the last people would have left from Bagram, the last Afghani translators, the last Afghani women that we were prepared to take, the last American diplomat, and then the last soldier would have gotten on the last C-17. That did not happen because Joe Biden made political choices to maximize, as Senator Cotton said, chest thumping that yesterday became angry blame shifting. I'll be right back with Representative Scott Franklin on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Kabul, the catastrophe in Kabul. I am joined by Representative Scott Franklin of Florida's 15th Congressional District, 1986 graduate of the United States Naval Academy, uh, an aviator off carriers for many years. He retired as a commander from the Navy. Uh, he mobilized after 9-11. I'm not sure if he flew over Afghanistan. Uh, Congressman Franklin, welcome back. Did uh, I haven't seen you since dinner in Alexandria, and I forget. Did you ever fly over Afghanistan? Hey, good morning, Hugh. Uh, actually, no. Unfortunately, I was I was on the staff side at that point. But uh, as I've watched all this unfold, it's just been incredibly disappointing. Uh, four days after 9-11, I was on a plane headed to Bahrain and spent the next six weeks or so planning the initial strikes uh, into Afghanistan and, and then was called up to CENTCOM after that. So, uh, you know, went from having this... Uh, you know, this gut punch of watching the buildings fall on 9-11 and then feeling like I had an opportunity to go over and do something about it. And now here it is 20 years later, almost to the day. Um, we've got these these visual images that we'll never forget of what a disaster we're seeing unfold in Afghanistan now. Uh, Representative Franklin, uh, the administration is using Axios this morning to put out a message that the cupboard was bare when they took over. There was no plan on the Trump administration's part to evacuate diplomats, civilians, humanitarian aid workers, interpreters, et cetera. Is that adequate to this situation to explain the fiasco? It's not a fiasco. It's a catastrophe. Is, is there any blame to be shifted to the Trump administration? Absolutely not. This, this, the timing and the manner of this uh, departure is all of Joe Biden's choosing. Didn't have to be this way. Would not have been this way under President Trump. And uh, but it's it's like we've seen for the last seven months at every turn, every mistake uh, is someone else's fault other than the administration's. But it's all their own doing. Now, I want to play for you, Mark Thiessen, yesterday talking about what happened. He's a former Bush speechwriter. He was on Fox and Friends or a, a Fox AM with Bill Hemmer and Dana Perino. Let's play the Mark Thiessen clip. And one of the things we did in Afghanistan in 2015 is we were not their nation building. We were not even fighting the war. What we were doing was we were providing them what, uh, what Jack Keane described on your show earlier. We were providing them with intelligence, mission planning and air support. And they couldn't they, it's clear they couldn't defend the country without that. Name me a U.S. ally anywhere in the world who could. Do you think South Korea could defend itself against a North Korean invasion without the U.S. military there? If they could, then we should get out. Do you think Taiwan could defend itself against the Chinese invasion without the U.S. military? Japan, Germany, any of these countries could have defended Germany could have defended itself against the Soviet invasion. Ukraine could defend itself against Russia. No U.S. ally in the world could defend itself without some sort of level of U.S. support. That's why we have troops stationed in Korea. That's why we have troops in Japan. That's why we had troops in Germany during the Cold War to prevent a Soviet invasion over the Fulda Gap. So all these people running around blaming the Afghan army because we abandoned them and then saying they didn't fight is just shameful. It's victim shaming. You know, they, that we abandoned these people. We were we were the, the goal in Afghanistan was not to create a Jeffersonian democracy. The goal in Afghanistan was to make sure that there was a government in place that didn't wake up every morning saying that America must be destroyed and provide sanctuary to terrorists who wanted to actively destroy America. That mission was being accomplished by our United States military in Afghanistan. Mark. We were succeeding. We were doing it with twenty six hundred troops, which is less than we have in Spain today. And the idea that we pull that out and abandon that country to give it back, hand it back to the Taliban is shameful. Uh, Congressman Franklin, do you agree with Mark Thiessen that this is blame, victim shaming what the president did last night? Absolutely. I mean, that, I think that piece was spot on. I hadn't heard it, but I, I've already been 
uh, noting that with other people who talk about this this notion of forever wars and we needed to bring all our folks home you know we we've always maintained a presence in korea germany you name it heck we've even still got people in cuba after the spanish american war I mean, the thought of keeping uh, some troops there to help stabilize what we've left behind after we've brought our troops home is nothing new and it's what we should have done so uh, for these afghanis to to see uh, really read the writing that they were going to be uh, abandoned by the um, Biden administration, it's no wonder that they uh, have decided not to fight against the Taliban. They can't do it without the ISAR assets uh, that we had committed to them previously. But uh, you know, for the president to basically allude that, and the Secretary of Defense too, and he should know better, but to allude that these folks were cowards because they're not willing to fight for themselves, that's just it's shameful. And for the president to, for a guy who's never served a day in uniform in his life, to make those kinds of insinuations, I just think it's despicable. Uh, Mark Thiessen added that since 2015, in the handover of combat operations, 52 to 54,000 Afghan soldiers have been KIA, doesn't talk to the wounded, and that in this year alone, 2,800 Afghan soldiers have died fighting the Taliban. He was, he was ferociously angry and, ru- angry, and rightly so, that we are blaming them after the Wall Street Journal documented they couldn't fly the airplanes we gave them because we took the contractors away. Right. It's it's all a charade, and this is what we're seeing this president do time and again. And for someone who claimed to have all these decades of expertise and and uh, that he was the guy to lead us on the world stage, he's failing us dismally, I feel. Uh, would this have happened had President Trump remained in office? Absolutely not. And and President Trump, you know, he's, he's a, a deal maker, a negotiator. He makes things work, but he would never uh, take a bad deal. And it's... It, it's as though President Biden has just felt that, you know, he was ready to get out at any cost, you know, uh, no matter what the fallout might be. And that's just that would never have happened under the Trump administration. Was the Doha agreement conditions based? And if so, had the Taliban violated those conditions? Well, my understanding is they, they were it was conditions based and, and there was nothing that we've seen leading up to this pullout that, that would indicate that the Taliban were living up to those uh, expectations that were placed on them. But it didn't now, matter. I mean, the president was well, he was more concerned about the optics of a 9-11 uh, no later than date so that it would just make for good press back home. Now, the, the most the serious works. question of all is uh, not the counterfactual of whether or not Donald Trump had been reelected, but what actually happened. You have got a lifetime of service in the Navy. You know the capa- capacity of the American military. I ref- as a civilian, I refuse to believe that this was inevitable. I, I believe anyone could have organized this with any minimum amount of training that a commander of your rank, and Tom Cotton just said a captain in the Marine Corps, could have spent three months organizing a civilian evacuation and a diplomatic evacuation, and it was a lack of will on the part of the Biden administration. Do you agree with Senator Cotton? I agree with that, and then I look forward to the opportunity to question folks. I, I want to know why the president made the decision he made. Uh, did he disregard his military advice, or was he given bad advice? And, and you know, what led the military commanders, if they if, if they had issued different advice, uh, why didn't they stand up and, and argue? But um, this this should not have unfolded this way. It was completely preventable, and uh, would have been handled differently with others in charge. Ought there to be a special joint committee of house and senate to investigate the collapse in kabul and why this happened i think there will be and there should and i think um uh um, there's a lot of frustration on both sides of the aisle so i think it's something that we're going to take up uh now when it comes to um what the taliban ought to be afraid of i have not heard anyone give a clear statement of the rules of engagement for the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force members who are there defending civilians, diplomats, and allies. What do you think they are, and what should they be? Uh, I don't know what those what the ROE is in place at this point, but we I feel that we have an, a moral obligation to take care of those people who stood by our sides, and whatever that takes, we need to be there to protect them and get them out of the country. Uh, anything short of that uh, will reverberate for generations for us. Uh, do you think it's a uh, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, do, you, do you think we ought to have given up Bagram before the exit? No, absolutely not. And uh, 
I don't know uh, specifically how many troops it would, would be required to hold Bagram in the long run, but that's, you know, that's something that, uh, um, you know, as we start shifting our focus away from counterterrorism in the Middle East towards great power competition, uh, you know, China is a significant adversary. Bagram, uh, Bagram is some very prized territory. And I do remember when we were playing those initial strikes in Afghanistan, you know, the first, the first airstrikes going in there were having to be launched from carrier decks and the Northern Arabian Gulf. And these were, you know, uh, Hornet pilots that were having to refuel a couple of times and, and spend eight or nine hours in the cockpit uh, to, to get in country to, to drop those bombs and to head uh, territory right there from which we could operate something we shouldn't have given up. Now, I want to fo- cl- conclude by focusing on something, Congressman, and hopefully you'll be in a position to ask this question. Somebody made the decision to turn off the electricity at Bagram and evacuate Bagram and make Kabul our exit airport. Somebody made that decision. Somewhere along the way, they said, close Bagram, keep Kabul open, and send our troops to Kabul International Airport. Will we ever find out who made that decision and whether it was reviewed and by whom? We will find that out. I assure you that. As, as long as I have any opportunity in, in armed services and on the oversight committee, we're going to get to the bottom of those questions. Because that's the one... But, uh, that, that mystifies civilians like me, because if a civilian mm-hmm. spots an obvious thing, maybe there's an explanation. Maybe that it cost too much or the electricity power was compromised or it would have been harder to get the diplomats there. But they turned it off. And the Afghans before this catastrophe were saying they did so almost like the Clinton White House turned over the White House to the Bush White House intentionally right. in many instances in disrepair. Right, right. No, those, those are good questions, but, uh, you know, the reality is that the world is a much more dangerous place today, and you can bet that Russia and China and North Korea and uh, Iran, they're, they're all watching this and, and watching how we respond, and you can bet that we're going to be testing and testing in the coming months because uh, these are all nations that, that uh, they only respect strength, and what they've seen now in the Biden administration is nothing but weakness. Representative Scott Franklin, thank you for joining me. I appreciate that. Have a good one. Thank you. I want to go back and make sure you hear some of the cuts evaluating the president's speech yesterday. Jonathan Lemire, AP on MSNBC, cut 23. Joe Biden is going to be the face of the failure of the withdrawal. He is the president right now as this is happening. And just a few weeks ago, just a little over a month ago on July 8th, when he defended the decision in Afghanistan, he talked about how, and I'll quote from him here, there's going to be no circumstance where you see people lifted off the roof of an embassy in the United States from Afghanistan. But we are seeing scenes like that play out in Afghanistan right now. Terrible footage coming from the airports of hundreds of Afghan citizens trying to cling to jet American jets as they're taking off, mm. including extremely disturbing footage this morning about some people after the planes take off falling from the planes back to the tarmac, uh, back to the streets below. Really difficult to watch. Peter Baker, New York Times reporter on MSNBC with Andrea Mitchell, cut number 10. Is, is, is sort of unfathomable. I mean, the truth is, I'm not an intelligence expert. I don't know what the intelligence agencies told the president, but certainly enough people have told this White House over the months that this was an almost inevitable outcome, whether it happened today, tomorrow, or, or months from now. Almost everybody understood that this is what was going to happen. So knowing that that was the case and knowing that it could happen very quickly, given the history in Af- Afghanistan, uh, you know, clearly they didn't move fast enough uh, or orderly enough to avoid the exact kind of chaos we're seeing right now. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, situation that the, uh, the administration has, uh, uh, you know, has, is, has to deal with at this point. Welcome back, America. Jesse B. Waters is, of course, familiar to many of you. He has got a brand new best-selling book out, How I Saved the World, Jesse Waters. He was a huge hit when he visited the Nixon Library earlier this month and How I Saved the World sold and sold and sold and How I Saved the World continues to sell and sell and sell. Jesse, I got to talk to you about messaging generally, but you know, Frank Luntz's rule, if you don't say How I Saved the World seven times, they won't remember your book as How I Saved the World. So you're pretty good at this communications business. Have you been mentioning How I Saved the World seven times in every interview? (laughs) You know, I should have taken that Luntz advice. Uh, some people say I haven't plugged the book enough to you, and I agree. So that's why I'm here to talk to you today. Well, How I Saved the World is really doing very well. Jennifer Horn, who I saw 
when I hosted the California recall debate the following week was it back at the library said you just charmed the living daylights out of a crowd of 700 people. Are you doing many live events for how I saved the world? Well, we've done a few, but kind of COVID kicked our butts and Harper Collins, my publisher isn't paying for a big chunk of the book tour. So am I going to put a lot of my own money up to fly all over the country to sell the book? No, I'm just going to do radio hits with Hugh Hewitt and plug the heck out of it on Fox News. But I will be doing a live book signing in Long Beach Island in New Jersey on August 31st. It's a Tuesday at about 11 in the morning. So I hope everybody comes out and get a signed book, a photo. I'll even let them touch me, Hugh. Oh, well, Jesse, where do people get, you know, most authors have book tour details out there. Do you have a book tour page anywhere where they can find out about the Long Island signing, et cetera? Yeah, you can go to all my social media pages, my Facebook page, my Instagram, my Twitter account, and you can find all the relevant information there, how I save the world. Uh, I think that's my second mention, so I need to, I need to get better at this. Yeah, we've got nine in, so they know how I save the world is the title. Jesse, the... Um, <laughs> The, the fact is, Joe Biden didn't save the world, much less Kabul. I know you talked about it last <laughs> night, but I didn't see it because I actually I was so disgusted by the speech I turned it off. Uh, what did you make of that blame shifting, absolutely embarrassing speech by the president yesterday? It was a total dodge. We all wanted to get out of Afghanistan. We just didn't want to get out of Afghanistan that way. Imagine having 20 years to plan for something and botching it. And then Biden actually said he did plan for it. So that was actually Biden's plan. He's saying, I'd love to see what it looks like when he wings something. This is the same guy that botched the Iraq withdrawal, pulled out and let ISIS take over, the same guy that couldn't rescue our guys in the consulate in Benghazi. And intelligence is showing that the guys that they released from Gitmo back to the Taliban were the ones that were leading the surge in Kabul. So this is a Joe Biden who's kind of been able to hide his incompetence. He was able to hide with in the Senate on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He was able to hide as the VP for Barack Obama and was able to hide during the campaign because of COVID. And now his incompetence has just been laid bare. You can't hide it for that long. And we saw the incompetence on the border. We saw it with the vaccine distribution when they paused J&J vaccine confidence just went down into the toilet and now this withdrawal and it's humiliating a total disgrace and the fact that we let black hawk helicopters m4s drones humvees get into the hands of the taliban it's a total catastrophe and we leave all of our partners stranded we leave americans stranded it's just not the way that America wants to watch us end a war after 20 years. And, and the American people have a complete right to feel disgusted by that basically poor and sloppy execution. Now, Jesse, I had a very interesting conversation this morning with Dr. Collins of NIH. Now, I, I always treat my guests graciously, and we have some very significant disagreements. But I think I got them to agree with me that the CDC, the FDA, and the public health authority generally – are very poor communicators on the boosters. And you just mentioned j and I didn't even explicitly bring that up. Do you think they have any, we're professional broadcasters. I've been doing this 30 years. You're probably in your second decade, uh, well into your second decade. Do you think the government has any idea on how to communicate anything? I really don't. Uh, we saw that with the CDC on school reopenings. We've seen it with masks. We've seen it with vaccines. And they just don't tell the truth. And that's the problem with Fauci and the mask mandates. You know, first masks didn't work, and then you had to double mask. You know, schools were safe, but then, no, now you have to do remote learning. People don't understand the facts. You know, in our business, we're really cutting edge. We know all the information as it's coming, and it's our job. We have people and producers that feed us all of these all this analysis constantly, all day long. Most Americans aren't living like that. You know, they're working, they're raising families, they're commuting, they're busy. They have different types of jobs. So when they tune in, and it's not often, but when they do tune in and hear conflicting information, this is exactly right. Uh, it's confusing. 
This is exactly what I told him, Jesse. Uh, You know, your book is How I Saved the World. Your name is Jesse Waters. I have said that 10 times. People will remember it. They will buy the book. If the FDA would sit down and listen to some pros, it would get better. Jesse Waters, thank you. Come back. Thank you for going to the library. Jesse B. Waters, two T's on Twitter. I'll be back tomorrow, America, with more. Thank you, Dwayne and Adam. Thank you, Harley and Ben. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show.